And welcome to Dialogue Gospel Study, today, December 11, 2022, uh, with Nylon McBain teaching. Uh, we are going to be talking today about, because this is our last session for the year, we're going to be talking about the entire Old Testament or Hebrew Bible um, as a kind of retrospective or overview. Um, I have with me today uh, from the Dialogue Foundation Board myself, Chris Kimball, conducting, and Michael Austin who's handling the tech and will be more on the screen than usual. Um, we also have with us, uh, let me get to my names here, Ariel Bybee Lawton, who's going to be uh, participating. Ariel is Nyland's first cousin and the namesake of her mother, Ariel Bybee. Mm -hmm. um, she has a PhD in religion from Duke University and studies and writes about women, gender, and sexuality in early Christianity. Uh, Sylvia Cabas, who will be offering the closing prayer. And with us today, she's a senior technical advisor on gender equality and women's empowerment with the Peace Corps um, and a member of the Capitol Hill Ward in Washington, D.C., where she and her husband were recently featured in the social media campaign for the reopening of the Washington, D.C. Temple. And uh, Kristen Southwick, whom I... Um, who just joined us, and I don't have any more to say about you, Kristen... Um, you'll That's have right. to introduce yourself later. Uh, we, um, let's see, as a few more words of introduction uh, for logistics, uh, those of you who are live on Zoom today, you're invited to post respectful and relevant comments and questions. And because of the nature of this lesson, we're particularly interested in looking for um, a, a conversation about what we have learned and talked about with respect to the Old Testament this entire year. Uh, we'll follow along and, and try to introduce your comments and questions as we go. Um, and now I'd like to take a few minutes to promote dialogue and then we'll begin. Um, we have, uh, this is a dialogue program and uh, I, let me refer you to the website dialoguejournal.com. There's a lot of exciting things going on. All of the previous gospel study lessons are tagged there. They're available um, uh, through YouTube as uh, recordings. We have a dialogue book report, which has a new post dropped this week regarding strange Mormon fiction. The Dialogue Out Loud program has a new reading out this week called uh, Trans in the Chapel, Attending Church as a Newly Out Transgender Woman by M. English. We're going to have a dialogue book club discussion this evening on Carolyn Klein's new book, Mormon Women at the Crossroads, Global Narratives and the Power of Connectedness. And as always, the latest issue of the journal is available there in full text and full color, along with the entire archive, more than five decades of, of the dialogue journal, scholarship, poetry, essays, sermons, fiction, art, um, it's all available there, all online, all searchable. We have um, we have a new pitch for um, fundraising, and uh, we'd like to we'd like to show that to you. My name is Zachary Davis. My name is Morris Thurston. My name is Rebecca Deschweinitz. My name is Michael Austin. I'm a board member of the Dialogue Foundation. We are asking for your financial support. Dialogue has thrived for nearly six decades because of the subscribers and donors who share a vision of thoughtful and rigorous scholarship, deeply personal essays, poetry, art, fiction, and more. We're so proud of all we've accomplished this year, but we need your support to continue. We are excited to announce the launch of the new Dialogue website, a beautifully redesigned way to experience the journal. We've improved the look and feel, made it easier to search and navigate, and added tons of new features, like author pages, for each of the more than 4,000 writers who have published in Dialogue over the years. The journal is at the heart of what we do. In 2022, we published groundbreaking issues, including the historic special issue on Heavenly Mother in Critical Context, the first of any LDS venue exclusively on this topic. In addition to the journal, we continue to offer so much other great content. The Dialogue Gospel Study, available live and on YouTube and podcast, features a diverse range of expert teachers. Also, check out some of our poetry, fiction, and personal essays in the Dialogue Out Loud series. And keep up on the latest fiction and nonfiction books, including exclusive in-depth interviews 
on the Dialogue Book Report podcast. The Dialogue Book Club continues to grow with exclusive benefits and access for subscribers. We have exciting new picks for next year, featuring the best scholars and writers publishing right now. Members get to meet with the authors and hear behind-the-scenes stories. A few years ago, Dialogue made the momentous decision to make all of our print and podcast content completely free online with no paywall barrier. Subscriptions to the print edition alone do not cover the cost to sustain the journal, let alone our other ambitious offerings. We rely on donations to pay our bills. Your contributions keep us going. We have two ways to help create a sustainable model in this free online world. Annual consider a regular subscription to the print edition plus a donation or an annual contribution in lieu of print. In lifetime, consider a contribution to our sustaining fund to build a long-term foundation for Dialogue's future. We ask for your financial support to continue this legacy of good work and accomplish some of our future goals. Thank you for your generosity to Latter-day Saint thought and culture. I was muted there. Thank you. I uh, I would like to echo everything that was said there. At the time that video was made, I had no voice. Um, it was we've been through flu season, and I have uh, I'm just now able to speak. Um, as we open today, um, we're going to move to the lesson, and I'd like to emphasize as a, before I introduce um, Nana McBain that. Uh, as with any Latter-day Saint scripture study class, the views expressed today by anybody speaking are those of the individual teacher and participant. They do not reflect those of the Dialogue Foundation, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, Brigham Young University, or any of the academic communities or organizations that any of us belong to. Um, these are all individual voices, and that's the way this program runs, as with any um, gospel study. Um, we've, uh, we are excited to introduce Nylon McBain for our uh, lesson today. Nylon, Nylon has been an important voice in the Latter-day Saint and Utah women's advocacy for over a decade. First as the founder of the Mormon Women Project, a nonprofit dedicated to mobilizing Latter-day Saint women by telling their stories and exploring opportunities for increasing their voice within the church institution. Nyland's book, Women at Church, Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact, which explores possibilities for increased female participation in LDS administration, has been called a monumental piece of work, pivotal, and a remarkable resource that belongs in every Latter-day Saint home. Uh, Nyland's most recent book, Pioneering the Vote, The Untold Story of Suffragists in Utah and the West, came out in August 2020 as part of the Better Days 2020 celebration of the Utah and National Suffrage Anniversaries. Nyland's a graduate of Yale University, mother to three daughters, and lives in Salt Lake City. And we are delighted to have Nyland with us today. Um, for our lesson, we're going to begin with uh, the Sussex Carol, played by Anna Lapwood on the great Royal Albert Hall organ, and then an opening prayer by Christian Southwick. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful for the beautiful Christmas season that we are enjoying and for sacred music and how it helps us fill of the Savior's love for us and that he was born and lived such a consecrated life. We're grateful for those at Dialogue who have um, put together this meeting and we're grateful for Nylan and for her preparation and for the deep gospel knowledge which she has. And we ask this day that thou might bless us, that we may find answers to questions we may have, and that we may act on the promptings that we receive. Please, please bless Nylan that she may teach um, in a way that is pleasing to, unto her and unto thee. We are grateful for all that thou hast given us, and we ask thee for these blessings. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, amen.
Chris, would you like me to take it from here? Take it from here. You, okay. You're, as I, you're in charge. Just tell us where we're okay. going. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that beautiful prayer. Kristen is my dear friend of many years. We we're raising our children together. Uh, we recently had a, a, a eventful trip together with uh, to Europe with our cellists, and we have violinists in common. And uh, raising musical kids here and, and just really grateful to her for her friendship and um, thank you for that prayer. So I know you might need to drop off at some point, so feel free to, to do that, but I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm also so grateful that Ariel uh, Baby Lawton is here and excited to introduce you as the dialogue community to her and I'm grateful to Chris and Michael for, for being here as well and I'm excited to hear from Sylvia who um, I, I first met many years ago uh, as I was involved with the Mormon Women Project and grateful to have her here as well. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to explain my musical selections. Um, those who know me will know that the, the music is very important to me. Um, and uh, Anna Lapwood, who I we just featured, is probably my favorite follow on Instagram. She was a harp uh, prodigy, believe it or not. She first excelled at the harp. Um, and I know she looks about 14, but she she has already had a career as a harpist and she moved into uh, the organ and she is now the conductor of an all girls choir at Pembroke College at, Ch at Cambridge. And by sheer force of personality and exceptional musical skill, she's actually catapulted this like little girls choir um, to international fame. And they just put out their first album of Christmas uh, Christmas songs. And she also um, has had a, a stellar career as an organist and, and this is a featured organist at Royal Albert, Albert Hall. So hopefully you got a fun, a fun sense of her range of skills from that video. Um, the closing hymn is going to be uh, an arrangement of a Spanish carol uh, called um, Lord, oh, I just, I just, it disappeared. Uh, Lord, and I think I, I met you at the lakeside. I think that's what it is. Um, and it's an arrangement of a, a, an original carol Lord, by... Lord, you have come to the lakeshore. You have come to the lakeshore. Thank you. By uh, Cesar uh, Gabarian, who was a Spanish priest and composer um, who actually just died in 1991. So he, he lived through most of the 20th century. And apparently this carol was uh, Pope John Paul II's favorite hymn. Um, the arrangement actually is was done and is actually performed by a man named um, S. Andrew Lloyd, Andy Lloyd, who uh, is is an org also organ organ professor at um, University of Texas uh, Austin, I believe, uh, San Antonio. Excuse me, San Antonio. And the reason I chose this was because um, Andy Lloyd actually just won the first inaugural year of the Ariel Bybee Endowment. Uh, grant. And the Ariel Bybee Endowment is um, something that I worked on with the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts in New York City, um, an endowment that we started in my mother's name after she passed away almost five years ago. And we had our inaugural uh, grant cycle this past year where we commissioned uh, the composition of uh, new art songs for Rachel Willis Sorensen, who is an internationally recognized soprano, and Andy won. Um, and we just have been blown away by his works and his compositions, his original original compositions. As I said, this is an arrangement, but I'm really excited for you to hear him and, and get, get to know him. So he'll be on the piano and we have a there's a what he this is a, pr a production of a, a recording of uh, the performance of his 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 arrangement uh, done at uh, in San Antonio. So uh, you have that to look forward to. You can stick around to the end for that. If nothing else, um, that'll be worth it. Uh, and um, yeah, so I, 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 the way I want to schedule this lesson is really to spend just the first 20 minutes of that sharing my own perspectives and a couple of points that I want to make today about the Old Testament. And then, you know, of all the lessons this year, I think this one really lends itself the best to getting your opinions and to getting the opinions of other people who I know have said, you know, a lot more experience in biblical studies than I do. And, you know, you've got several of them right right here with their, their faces on the screen. So um, I know Zoom is not the, the ideal place to do this. So um, I'd like 
I've, I've asked Ariel and Chris and Michael to, to take some time at the end to share their impressions um, and thoughts with us here. But I also have the Q&A box open and I know uh, Michael can see our comments. And so um, if it's you know convenient and if you feel um, moved to, please do share some of your own reflections as we go through and, and talk about some of these points because um, this is our summary lesson for the Old Testament. And um, I'd love to, to get as much participation as possible in this very awkward setting. So um, I am really, really excited to be teaching today's lesson because um, I, of course, you know, when I, my engagement with the church um, administratively and uh, sort of um, institutionally has, has, you know, traditionally been around uh, the role of women at church. But um, my actual um, first love, uh, scripturally, was the Old Testament. Um, the Hebrew Bible was introduced to me as a seminary student. So I grew up in New York City, which is an unusual place to grow up in the church. And um, I had the very rare experience of having um, a, a Hebrew biblical scholar, well, she wasn't a scholar, an amateur scholar, um, be my seminary teacher. So um uh, Raylene was of um, came from a Jewish family. She was an accountant in New York City, I believe, and some sort of in, worked in the financial industry. And she had gone to Hebrew University, spoke Hebrew fluently, and had a double life in her Upper West Side synagogue congregation, where she was actively participant, uh, actively participating, while of course also coming to our ward there at Lincoln Square. Um, and I had her all four years, and um, it was an absolutely remarkable experience. And uh, she actually took our, our, we had four people in our class. She actually uh, planned a trip to Israel after my sophomore year of high school. And so I got to go to high school with her. I mean, I got to go to Israel with her and, um, and of course, attend High Holy Days at her, at her synagogue. And so um, that combined with the fact that I went back to Israel in college, which I'll talk about later um, meant that I really, um, and, and the fact that I grew up in New York City, you know, about half of my school class was Jewish. We got all the holidays off of school. Um, I remember distinctly riding, you know, riding the bus home from school with my best friend while she was practicing her Hebrew for Hebrew school, you know, so it was, it was very much this sort of, um, not just the doctrine, but the culture of, um, of Jewish observance was really, really seeped into my childhood. Um, and I went on to study it in college and go back to Israel, as I mentioned. So I love the Old Testament and I love its its weirdness. One of the reasons I also love the Old Testament is because I was an English major in college um, and I love the text and I just love how complex and kind of um, pieced together it can feel at times and how we have to really um, you know, in order, you don't have to understand the context and the history to, to be spiritually fed by it. But I do think for me, understanding the history and the context helps the text come alive. And I love this text. It feels so, um, it feels so foreign and out of reach at times. And yet at other times, it really speaks to me as my own spiritual heritage and as a connective tissue to people who you know, lived thousands of years ago, but have made the similar sort of covenants um, to a being that 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 I do today, and that there are strands of what they did thousands of years ago that are still alive and well in our practice today. Um, and I, uh, I I really really have have loved it, and I have had the opportunity to be the gospel doctrine teacher in every ward I've ever lived in. <laughs> um, so including right now. So I taught my last uh, Old Testament um, lesson in my own ward last week. And um, I, I did a little bit of a summary, but I really also had to stay focused on Habakkuk. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to to refocus today on some themes from the whole year uh, and to pull out some things that really hit me. Um, so I'm going to just mention three themes that I tried to focus on in my teaching this year. Um, delve into them a little bit, but as I mentioned, I'm also going to open uh, the the, the um, conversation to our panelists and anybody who wants to participate in the chat or Q&A. Um, 
first of all, I'm just pulling some notes up over here. So there, as I mentioned, for me, I see the Old Testament as a text. And in looking at a text, and uh, there were there are two major questions that came to my that come to my mind whenever I'm looking at a text, especially one that purports to be a historical text. Um, the first is, of course, who wrote this, um, and what was their motivation. If you can really look at, um, you know, who 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 put these these stories together, and what their motivation was to convey to their own people at their time, and also to the people that come after. Um, I think we see things in a whole new light. I'm, I'm seeing a comment here in the chat already that someone here was raised by with her, the idea that the Old Testament was very vengeful and violent, that the Old Testament God was vengeful and violent, and that this year she saw that she was wrong. She was focused on the mercy and social justice elements. I think for me, the thing, one of the things that's helped me wrestle with the vengefulness and the violence in the Old Testament is this is answering those questions of who wrote this and why did they write it? Because the moment you take that step back and you look at the motivations, you see that this was written by a people and for a people that were trying to hold their community together um, and that were a very small tribe in the midst of a global region that was encroaching upon them both spiritually, politically, militarily, physically, um, and you you can see those sort of elements of self-preservation that come through the text um, and really help um, not soften, but kind of just give context to uh, some of the things that could be perceived as just, you know, us versus them tribalism. Um, and uh, and so what the, when I when I approached the the Old Testament at the very beginning of the year, I told my class I was always going to be looking at the four C's culture, community, conflict, and covenant. And I in every one of my lessons I tried to go back to one of those four culture, covenant, community, and conflict. And I think when I did that, I was able to keep in mind um, you know the place of this text in history. Um, and the place of this people in history, and what was motivating them um, to collect these stories, write these stories, have the angles that they did, um, and preserve them for posterity. Um, another thing that that I tried to to keep in mind uh, that maybe you know sort of was an aha moment for some of you as you were reading this text this year is that uh, is a phrase that I know this is historians that I've worked with a lot love to uh, refer to. There's there's two phrases, actually. Um, the first is that, you know, the, the past is a foreign country. Um, you've probably heard that before. This idea that, like, when you're traveling back thousands of years to visit a culture um, and a people and a text, then you need to approach it as if you are going to a, a the most exotic, um, unknown, un, unfamiliar culture in the world today. Um, it's as if we were planted in the middle of the Amazon, right? Or um, some far re reaches of Pacific Islands or wherever you've never been and whatever culture you don't know anything about. Um, that's the way you need to approach uh, these texts and this culture. And I think, you know, that language of violence and that language of um, us versus them tribalism also comes into a little bit more focus uh, when you are, have have that humility and are able to see that sometimes our terms of um, equality or social justice or um, equanimity sort of are 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 much more modern concepts than we can really overlay onto this text. That's not to say we shouldn't do it, but just to approach it with that kind of humility um, has been helpful. And the second phrase that historians use a lot that I think is really helpful in looking at the Old Testament is that the future changes the past. And what that means is that um, anything that happened in the past can almost never be interpreted right there in the moment. Um, we interpret the past by looking at what comes later. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think for us, one of the things that I tried to do in my classes this year was sometimes remove the Hebrew Bible from its Christian um, um, interpretation. Uh, it, so for me, one of the things I tried to do in my lessons was challenge my class to sometimes say, okay, 
you know, we have this phrase, saviors on Mount Zion, for instance, and some of the Isaiah passages, you know, these passages that for us are messianic or that explain or help or have a whole new light because of what came later, they still have deep spiritual significance and, and are famous and are revered within communities that don't have that same future to interpret them. Um, and I think that, that that's another element of humility that I that I think is important when we come to the Old Testament to say, you know, we are looking at it from the point of view of everything that came later, from our beliefs that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, um, from our beliefs that Joseph Smith entered, uh, that uh, ushered in another dispensation, right? That our beliefs that what Jacob was doing and what Solomon was doing and what Moses were doing were, were temple rituals, right? Um, that we do again, still today. And I think it's important to sometimes strip all of that away and say, you know, for, for people um, who don't have any of that later context and who don't have those interpretive tools to look at the past with the lens of the future, you know, um, why are these things still important? Why are they still beautiful? Why are they still resonating with people thousands of years later? Um, and and so I, I, I think that... Um, you know, looking at the Old Testament with that level of humility and that, those kinds of lenses uh, can help again address some of these things, address some of these these more challenging elements of the Old Testament. Um, the the first real theme that I want to bring up today that I saw that I see in the Hebrew Bible um, as really the driving force behind the entire set of texts is a cycle of exile and return. And hopefully, if you've been paying attention at all this year, that shouldn't be revolutionary. Um, the, the, old, the, the, the stories um, and the purpose I see, and again, I'm excited to hear other people's uh, opinions about this, but for me, the Hebrew Bible is a Russian stacking doll, a matryoshka doll of stories of exile and return. And Covenant keeping is built into that, but essentially we start with the story of two people who um, make covenants and um, break those covenants. They are forced to leave the presence of God, and there is a process promised to them by which they can return. And we see this cycle start with Adam and Eve and this the most the smallest unit possible of, of human gathering on this earth. And we see it blossom layer by layer by layer into larger groups of people. You know, you, first of all, you have Noah, right? He, he has this, um, he, he's the, the people, the people around him apostatize, they leave, right? And through his journey on the water, He's able to return and come back. We, of course, have the Exodus, famously. We have, um, we, you know, even before the Exodus, though, we have, we have Joseph. He has to leave, right, his, his family. We have, the, at that point, we're at a fa kind of familial level, right? Um, leave his family and then return them, bring them back in together. Um, and then, of course, we have Moses. We have the tribal level, right? Um, and, and then, you know, we have all of these stories continuing to reverberate throughout the, the the first part of the Old Testament, especially in Genesis, of course. We have Abraham and Sariah leaving their, their homes and having to sort of renew their covenant by receiving new names and being gathered back into the to God's presence. So it's a, it's a very metaphorical sometimes, but it's also a very physical and literal journeying away from God um, to be back returned back into his presence. And I think the thing that really trips people up about the second half of the Hebrew Bible is that we sometimes lose sight of the story because it's complicated. It's drawn out. It's not as simple as Adam and Eve or the Exodus or Noah. We lose, we lose sight of it because um, it's so massive. It's so geopolitical. The story of the Hebrew Bible is the story of the Babylonian captivity and the Assyrian captivity before that. And if we if we if we underestimate the importance 
of the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, we don't understand the impetus for who wrote the Old Testament and why, what their motivation was. We don't understand what literally half of the text is trying to tell us. Half of the text of the Old Testament is focused on just a couple of decades around those that period, you know, a hundred years or so. We don't understand what all of these uh, apocalyptic writers are trying to tell us. We don't understand, um, you know, the scattering of Israel. We don't understand what it means to have the lost 10 tribes. We don't understand what the division of the house of Israel was really about and why we're engaged in even gathering Israel. We don't even understand what that means. And we don't understand what it means to have um, the gathering of Israel be that spiritual fulfillment of that last scattering, of that last exile. And so I think, you know, as wonderful as Genesis is, as wonderful as Exodus, the story of Exodus is, as wonderful as the story of Abraham and Sarah, I think one of my goals this year in teaching the Old Testament was to keep our interest engaged in the story. Because I think, you know, once we get to David and Solomon and Kings and Chronicles, everybody just kind of gets muddled. But the story of the second half of the Old Testament is our story. It's the story of the scattering of Israel. And once we understand that, we understand that we are involved in the return from that journey right now through our commitments in the temple, through our missionary work, through our, our membership as, as a covenant people. Um, and so 587 BC, if there's any date that you leave this year with, I hope you know 587 BC and 722, 722 BCE. Those are the dates of the, the, the scattering of our, of our ancestors, of uh, our spiritual ancestors by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And um, so that, 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 that recommitting to that story was really one of the themes for me this year in teaching um, the Hebrew Bible. Um, another theme that I wanted to um, bring up, and I'd love to hear some, some thing, again, some, some responses later on, is this idea of a covenant people and what does that mean in the modern era? Um, the, the, the Hebrew Bible is, of course, the record of a covenant people. We learn in Genesis 17 what the promise was that God made to Abraham. And that promise, that covenant, um, that, you know, that that his posterity would cover the face of the earth and that he would be blessed is 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 of course the through line in the entire text um, and the entire you know thousand plus, thousands of years history that we that we study in this text. Um, what that necessitates is again that sense of of almost of tribalism that motivates the creation of this text that motivates the people who wrote this text to defend their actions, um, to explain their actions, to to bemoan the fact that the people around them are um, worshiping other gods and are 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 um, looked down upon by their god and and punished by their god. Um, there is an us versus them mentality in the Old Testament, which I think is inescapable. And um, this year, I and I don't I'm going to say out front, I don't have any great answers for this. So I'd love to hear from from you. I really tried to wrestle with this idea of what does it mean to have um, a text from one point of view where the people think they're always right. They're not well, not always right, but they think that they are the chosen people. Right. They think that they are the covenant people and to have that covenant renewed in us today. And for me to say myself, yes, I have made a unique and special covenant with God. What does that mean um, in light of our modern sense of um, egalitarianism, social justice, um, the fact, the basic fact that we know that God loves all his children? Um, I wrestled with this a little bit, especially in the sense of the Babylonian captivity. You know, last week, for instance, um, I was teaching Habakkuk, and Habakkuk asks at the very beginning of his book, he says, why are you having these other people around us punish us, your chosen people? Why are these evil Babylonians who worship other gods and who are destroying our temple? And, you know, why are you having them be the ones who enact your justice? Right? 
And it's a really powerful question um, because I think what we have to wrestle with in the Old Testament is that God uses other people to act upon his covenant people, act upon his chosen people. And so, you know, when we put when we look at that today and we think, well, as as covenant keepers, as a covenant people walking a covenant path, you know, what role does that put the world in around us? Um, we have we we still have language in in the church around you know us, us versus them. We have you know the world versus you know we're in the world but not of the world. The world can be evil. Worldly things can be things that we want to separate ourselves from. Um, we have military language in our hymns. You know we're going out to battle, um, and and I, I I really have wrestled with this. But one thing that I have noticed in the study of the Old Testament that did bring me comfort is this idea that sometimes God uses other people to to enact um, his will, and he loves those other people too. And they have their own stories, right? They have their own stories. Um, I think Patrick Mason has done a beautiful job in his book, Restoration, of sort of illuminating this idea a little bit in his his thesis of this, this idea that, um, you know, other communities and other kinds of people have maybe other roles, right? And that we have a specific role in our modern world of this, this sort of gathering of Israel, this temple work. But that's not to say that God doesn't love his other people and that they don't have special roles too. We know that all each of the 12 tribes of Israel had a special designated spiritual role, right? Um, and that's been kind of obscured and lost in both in the text and in our modern world. Um, but I, I think those were some of the, just some very simple ideas that kind of have helped me wrestle with this um, as I've studied the Old Testament this year. Uh, before I open it to our panelists, so last thing I want to mention that has really been important to me as I finished the Old Testament is the idea of um, Lehi and Lehi's family being a continuation of this culture, this community, this covenant, and this conflict that we've just finished studying this year. Um, you know, I think sometimes we can see Lehi and his visions and the way he interacts with his family at the beginning of the Book of Mormon as being very different from where we leave off kind of at, at, at the, the, you know, um, certainly at the time of the Babylonian captivity, when he leaves Jerusalem, um, and not to mention the end of the Old Testament, more more in the in the post exile period and getting back into Malachi. But when we, when and I think the reasons that we see them being a different is, is are very stylistic. You know, in Le Lehi is very comfortable talking about his family and his children. He talks about messianic prophecies and his visions, right? Um, very very outwardly, he talks about you know, people that we identify uh, as part of our our modern paradigm, right? We, we think we see Columbus in there. We think we see, you know, right? So, so we, we, we see him as a much, as very modern, whereas his contemporary in Jerusalem at the time, for instance, Jeremiah, we still see Jeremiah as being very um, removed and antiquated and kind of out of, out, you know, hard to understand. But, um, you know, I think there's a tremendous amount of, of comfort and continuity that we can draw as members of the church in understanding that Lehi and Nephi and that civilization was founded out of those same, that same cultural foundation. And in fact, when we start looking at Lehi and Nephi's visions, we see so many um, uh, continuations of, and metaphors and m images and, t and poetic uh, tools that Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Habakkuk and Nahum are also using. Um, and I won't go into all of that today, but I, I had fun with that in my last lesson last week of looking at some of these these um, these textual continuities that we can see moving from the 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 pre-captivity, pre-exile period to Lehi actually in the New World. Um, the idea of the temple, the continu continuity of the temple, um, has been is important to recognize that even though the temple in Jerusalem was being destroyed, um, you know, scholars since the, since the translation of the Book of Mormon, right, since the coming of the Book of Mormon, have have identified the fact that there were temples outside of Jerusalem, 
I mentioned at the very beginning that I went back to Israel in college. The reason I went back to Israel in college was because I, I worked on a kibbutz at um, Tel Megiddo, which is in the Jezreel Valley, and it is an archaeological project that's being um, run in conjunction with a number of universities. But uh, when I was there, I, you know, I was had my little brush for the summer, and I was like brushing off pottery, and it was very not exciting. But um, in the 20, 25 years since I've been there, they actually have discovered a temple on Tel Megiddo um, that was patterned after the temple in Jerusalem, and they found about five other temples, um, including one outside of in Egypt um, that were built after the manner of Solomon's temple. So when Nephi tells us that he, one of the first things he did was build a temple after the manner of Solomon's temple, um, there was precedent for that. And I, I, in, from the culture that he was coming from. So I find that very moving. And again, I find that very connecting to, to this, this book that can seem very off-putting sometimes. Um, so those are my three themes. And I'd love to turn the time over now. I'm going to turn it first to Ariel because I, I know she's um, prepared and got some wonderful thoughts. Um, and then Michael and, and, and Chris, I'd love to hear from you as well. And um, uh, please, again, do feel free to put any observations of your own in the chat or the questions. Um, but uh, I, I appreciate that. And then, of course, I'll come back at the end to wrap up. So, Ariel. Thanks, Nylan. Um, I was hoping to go last, not first, but <laughs> I'll do my best here. I'm a scholar of early Christianity, so the Old Testament is foreign ground to me. And I think um, Nylan seems to have an easier time with it than I do. There have been several times during the year we were reading in Sunday school, I just thought, I am quitting. Like, I am this, I'm done here. This feels repetitive. I'm going back to the the Book of Mormon, I'm going to read the New Testament, I'm going to do something else. Um, and yet, when I really stick with it, um, I actually found that those books were more meaningful and richer. And just to add on to something Nalan said, she was talking about how we we could not, we, we really, it was so critical that we understand the Assyrian and the Babylonian captivity and how this kind of like plays out as a major theme. Um, I really, as I stuck with that and then turned back to the Book of Mormon, I thought we really can't understand so much of the Book of Mormon without understanding that <clears throat> this was Lehi and Nephi and Jacob's culture and that that narrative continues to be very important to them. And I was particularly struck as I, I stuck with Isaiah this time, which is so hard, um, <clears throat> how much it added to the Book of Mormon for me to spend some good time in Isaiah. You cannot understand the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon without really understanding the captivity narrative, without understanding the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. Um, <clears throat> the I, I think as, as members of the church, we often like, you know, get to that part, first and second Nephi, and we, it starts getting kind of laden with Isaiah chapters. And we spend, you know, a little time thinking, okay, how can I liken this to myself? What does it have to do with me? And then we struggle with various degrees of success, and then we kind of move on and breathe, breathe a sigh of relief when we get past that and you get back to the story, right? Back to the good stuff. Um, <clears throat> but as I was reading Isaiah this time, um, it really struck me how um, maybe I'm, I'm wrestling in the wrong way, and maybe a more productive way was to think about Isaiah and Nephi in context of the Old Testament. When we step back and we consider not like how how should I be likening this to me with the Isaiah and the Book of Mormon? But look at how Nephi is likening it to him and why, and start asking the hows and whys of like why Nephi includes these chapters for himself. You know, it's not just, oh, I have this vision that people in the future are going to need this Isaiah in a second copy. So here it comes. It's Nephi using these personally. They have a, a real function for his life. They have an immediate function in his community. Um, and he's using them to kind of process and engage with and respond to what he's going through and what happened to him as he's writing and looking at his past and trying to make sense of it and to see the Lord's hand in it. Um, so I, I was just thinking, um, as I was going through the Book of Mormon this time, having really spent some time with Isaiah and thinking, what would this mean to Nephi as he's writing it? I was thinking about how much comfort Nephi is drawing from these chapters as he writes it. It's a it's a familiarity. It's a reminder. It's a it's a comfort that God always reaches out to his people. He finds them wherever they're lost. He brings them back. He continues to forgive them. He loves them. It gives meaning and purpose to the exile of his people as, as he reads these things to his people. 
and he's reassuring them with these things. No, these prophecies are real. Jerusalem really has been destroyed. We did not leave on a whim. We're not wandering around because my father was having fevered visions. You know, um, this this has really happened, and all these prophets have testified of it. But and and as Nyland pointed out, the book, you know, creates a kind of community cohesion. It's a it's a it's a it creates a tribalism that allows these this small group of Nephites who are wandering out in the desert in this this new land to kind of draw together and find a common purpose and a common goal and feel that there's something bigger than just this little group of people that they are under this umbrella of the house of Israel and that he has promised to gather them all again and that that return is is not only possible but it's absolutely inevitable that it's going to happen um, because he's made these promises so I mean reading reading the Isaiah and really focusing on that this year kind of really added to the richness of the Book of Mormon narrative for me and really helped make those chapters more meaningful to me and allowed me to see, well, Nephi is likening it to himself in this way. Like, can I liken it to myself in this way too? Like, you know, and, and let me see somebody else's process of likening it, which helped me in my own process of likening these scriptures. Because we know later the Lord comes back and says, everybody should still be reading this. It's not just for Nephi, it has meaning for all of us, but it's so hard. It's so hard to just look right at the Isaiah and find the meaning. But Nephi kind of helps us. He shows us how to find meaning in it. So I, I thought that that was really powerful as I spent some time with that. Um, one of the other themes that really struck me, and this kind of goes along with um, Nyland's discussion of, um, well, with many of Nyland's discussions, as I'll probably come back to in just a minute, but um, how how powerful, before the prophets, how powerful that Moses, the Moses story, the story of being rescued, the miraculous parting of the Red Sea, how it it sticks through the entire rest of the Old Testament. You see these prophets talking about it for hundreds and thousands of years after it happened, this legendary event where this, this, the Lord raises a prophet and he saves the children of Israel and parts the sea and, and kills a bunch of people in the process. And then how uh, this narrative keeps coming back as proof that God does miracles for Israel and how important it continues to be in the Old Testament, but then how this theme carries into the Book of Mormon. And reading the Old Testament this year, for the first time, I really could see um, how important this narrative was to Nephi and Lehi and Jacob still. And it comes, and, and the thing that struck me the most was in one of the most problematic parts of the Book of Mormon, the slaying of Laban by Nephi. This story of the Lord parting the Red Sea is hangs over the entire event. And if you look at the, the Book of Mormon, Nephi recounts this as he's sitting there pondering on whether he should kill Laban or not. He's thinking, well, I know that the Lord has parted the Red Sea. And it took me a while of thinking about that. I was like, what does that really have to do with this? But I, I, I came to understand something new about Nephi's, what I, I perceive to be the workings of his mind as he's dealing with this horrible dilemma about whether to commit murder or not at the moment. He's, he's recalling this. He's, he, and, 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 and it kind of helps him to frame his act, at least later on as he's writing this story about Laban in context of this, this miraculous parting. And he sees this Red Sea narrative to mean that God, first of all, can and, and really does kill people sometimes to protect the righteous, right? So it justifies that part of what he's done or what he, he's contemplating doing. And then, he, and then he kind of sees his access, his sudden and miraculous access to Laban as, as a miracle, not just as like a happy circumstance, but as, as the Lord actually parting the Red Sea, something that seemed impossible, the Lord has given him an unbelievable access to, to achieve this end of this goal. And it allows for the deliverance of this future posterity from dwindling in unbelief and perishing, just as Moses had saved the children of Egypt you know, with God's miraculous help. So the killing, the deception, when he's wearing the false clothing, when he, he misleads Laban, the servant, he steals the brass plates. Uh, as though he's spoiling the Egyptians as the children of Israel did as they're, they're going out. It's, it's all kind of understood, I think, and justified in his mind as he's looking back, or perhaps even at the time in context of this miracle of the Red Sea. It's such a, a powerful part of, his, of, of who he is as an Israelite and as a descendant of the house of Israel and having come out of Jerusalem that, that it has such a, a big part I, I don't think I'd ever considered in this whole episode of the slaying of Laban. Um, so I think I learned something new about Nephi, about who he is from engaging with the Old Testament this year, too. So those are just the two thoughts I wanted to share right off. 
Thank you, Ariel. Yeah, as I, you know, I'm so glad you picked up on that, that, that last theme I shared, because that was powerful for me too. that, that transition into, and unfortunately, we don't study the New Testament. I mean, we study the New Testament yet, not the, not the Book of Mormon, or maybe those kinds of connections would become more obvious to us as, as a, as a church community. You know, it's interesting how the order, it's like birth order, right? How the order, um, mixing that order up really helps us see new, new insights. Um, Michael, would you be willing to, I know, like, as Chris said at the beginning, sure. I know, oh no, I know you could spend an hour just doing this all on your own. So I want to make sure that um, you have time to, to leave us with, you know, any observations or high level thoughts that you've, you've had this year. Well, I won't take an hour, I promise. Okay. <laughs> but I do, I you know, I think you hit on something when you were talking that has just always been troubling to me and has been very important to me uh, that I really saw differently this year as I was reading the Old Testament. And that is the kind of um, nationalistic conquest narratives that we get. And there are a lot of them, I mean, in, in Joshua and Judges, uh, Deuteronomy, um, all the way down to Esther, the, the, the sort of not comfortable uh, genocide fantasy, ultra-nationalistic covenant means we're better than other people. And, um, you know, that is there. That, that is, there, there is that element in the Old Testament. I think what I noticed this year more than ever before um, is that there is a lot of pushback against that narrative in other books of the Old Testament. And putting those books in dialogue with each other is just extremely important. I mean, I'm thinking of Job, of course, um, that Job is very largely a, a rebuttal of the Deuteronomistic history and the, the very, very ultra-nationalistic assumptions therein. But so is Jonah. Uh, you know, Jonah uh, is about the conversion of, uh, of Nineveh, the, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Um, Ruth is a pushback against, uh, against this narrative, even against the narrative that we get in Ezra and Nehemiah about having to marry wives who are born in the covenant. And, and Ruth tells us no. Um, the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, uh, most of the what we identify as the wisdom literature, pushes back against this narrative. And what that tells me is that in Babylon, during the captivity, as people were assembling uh, what we call now the Old Testament, um, or, or the Tanakh, or the Hebrew Scriptures, there were differences of opinion about some very important things, and the text reflects that difference of opinion. And that difference of opinion, it, it just occurred to me as I was reading, really, Jonah this year, this follows into the New Testament. Um, that there are two different ways to view the covenant in the Old Testament. Uh, one of the questions in the chat, um, I really want to know more about the wise men. If they knew to follow a star to find their savior, who were they? Well, the Magi in Matthew were Zoroastrian priests. They were, they followed the, the dualistic religion of the Persians. Matthew, including the Magi in his narrative of Christ's birth, is carrying on a part of this argument and saying Christ is the Messiah of the Zoroastrians, not just of the Jews. There, there's a universality here. You know, the argument goes into Acts, it goes into Acts 15, the council in Jerusalem. Uh, there, there are, and all the way since the Babylonian captivity, I think, uh, I'm starting to realize there, there was a pro and a con. There were different voices and uh, it's a real skill, I think, to learn to to read books of Scripture um, as in conversation with each other without a great unifying synthesis at the end, but just realize that uh, a magnificent work of Scripture is that the library of a whole people has different voices, different authors, and those authors were in conversation with each other while they were writing it. Um, Julie Smith did a fantastic, edited a fantastic volume, um, When I Are, uh, As Iron Sharpens Iron, 
where she had different contributors. Um, and I believe I, I think I wrote one about Job arguing with Abraham, but the whole book is just scriptural figures arguing with each other because they do. And knowing that is important. I, I think always before I have been looking for unifying principles that resolve these arguments. And uh, it just really became very clear to me this year in, in so much of my reading that we don't have to unify all of the arguments because these books were written by different people struggling with the same questions and sometimes they came to different answers and that struggle is inspirational too so that's kind of what i want to leave with the end thank you yeah it's such a wonderful way to to bring us actually i think to the ultimate rebuttal right the ultimate um, commentator who was Christ himself, right? I mean, his birth, as you just mentioned, the whole setup of his birth was was constructed to break down those perceptions that there is a, a chosen people, there is one people, there's one kind of person who can worship and be worthy of the Savior, right? Um, the entire nar nativity story is a breakdown of that because you have different um, you know, with the wise men, you have different peoples represented uh, of different, um, you know, presumably, you know, geographic, ethnic peoples, but you also have different classes of peoples. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think that it, it, I, you, you put into words exactly what I felt this year is that like, there was, there's always this, this pushback. And in my mind, I think I go back to that question of why were they writing this? You know, I mean, if we were tasked with keeping our family together or keeping uh, some sort of institution we cared about together or keeping our nation together, right? We have binding stories. We have stories that, I mean, it's, it's, that's the impulse as old as time, right? You have stories that put you in a position of power so that people can rally around you. And, you know, I think um, there is a, there's a, a, a dark side to tribalism, but there's, a really important light side to it too, which is that it's um, motivating and uplifting and builds community. And so I think seeing that in dialogue all through the Hebrew Bible is fabulous. And of course, seeing the savior as the ultimate rebuttal of tribalism has some is, is really at the heart of my testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, Chris, I'd love to hear ideas from you too. If you feel like we need to wrap up, we can do that too and maybe talk mm -hmm. offline. No, I, I, we, may, we, we may want some conversation afterward. I, I know that Sylvia has some thoughts, and I want to make sure oh, there's at least some I time. I apologize, there. Sylvia. No, um, I, 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 I'll try to do this in, three, in two sentences. It, in line with what, we were, what you and Michael were just saying, I was impressed this whole year that by telling the story from the point of view of call it the patriarchs, Adam and Eve, Moses, Abraham, no, I'm sorry, Noah and Abraham, um, you have a setup that there's a kind of pure bloodline definition of the tribe. And yet everything that happens in detail, all the way down to the, the Matthew story of Jesus's genealogy, says it's not at all that simple. It's much more complicated with children leaving, with people coming in, with neighbors. And that's, that was my one line. I mean, I, I appreciate all that you've said. Um, yeah. Sylvia, have you, would you like, I, I, I apologize. I wasn't, I wasn't aware that you were, you were prepared to actually share. So we'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, and thanks for everyone's fantastic contributions. It really led me to reflect on a lot of what I learned over this past year. Um, one theme that has occurred to me, and maybe it's especially timely because of where we are in the world, is that of the role of climate change in the Old Testament. And to return to Nyland's theme of um, exile and return, a lot of the people who were exiled did not return, and a lot of their exile was provoked by the Lord expressing his anger through 
natural catastrophes. <laughs> uh, and it really struck me uh, because there's so much um, in the Old Testament about um, famine and pestilence and all these things that have forced uh, people to move from rural areas to urban areas, even though cities are seen as corrupt and evil. And yet they were the only uh, place for people to go. Um, and, you know, this region at the time and continues to be the breadbasket of the world. So it's especially um, striking that this is the way that the Lord uh, um, conveyed his displeasure it was through flooding and um, uh, and um, what's it called when you don't have any water? Drought. Flooding and drought. <laughs> Um, yeah. And my thoughts are formed by uh, my time in Morocco, Mali, and Burkina Faso, where in the midst of images of scarcity of the desert, of water or lack of water, you also have images of abundance, such as oases and olive trees. And that has really reminded me um, throughout our study of the, of the um, Old Testament. And I just want to um, close by saying that the theme of environmental stewardship is one that is very strong in our theology, even though people may not realize it. And starting with the beginning of Genesis, where uh, we are given dominion over everything on the earth, through our uh, temple ceremonies, where that's another uh, um, aspect that uh, we see, but we don't often discuss. And I think now that we're at this precipitous moment in our planet, that this is something that we could um, convey to our uh, fellow members who may be skeptical of climate change, but are also uh, hunters and fishers, that this is part of our theology and part of our um, mandate uh, to be good members. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I, I, I think your comments are an example of, you know, how exciting and refreshing it can be when we just take a look at these things that we've talked about and think we know for our whole lives. And we just put a different lens on them and really challenge ourselves to think more deeply about it and see new new things about it. So uh, that that was a revelation to me. Thank you. I love that. Um, well, I, I do just want to close to um, thank all of you for, for being here and just reiterate um, my testimony at this Christmas time that Christ was the great rebutter. I'm going to, that's, that's, that's my new favorite, favorite idea now. Um, he, he guided the people of the Old Testament. Um, they, they, they loved, um, they loved their God. They were his covenant people. They strove to um, live under the system that he had asked them to live under, to, um, to find their way for thousands of years as a small and beleaguered people, um, but that through the birth of Jesus Christ, um, you know, the promise was fulfilled that they could move on, that he would be the great and last sacrifice, that he was both the beginning and the end. And I'm really grateful for his example that puts puts to rest a lot of these concerns that we do have about the Old Testament and gives us a new and better way. So I'm grateful to be sharing those thoughts with you at this Christmas time. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We will enjoy um, Lord you have come to the lakeshore, arranged by Andrew Lloyd, um, and then have a closing prayer by Sylvia Cabas. Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, we are so grateful for this opportunity to reflect on a year of learning and study of the whole Testament. We are grateful for the dialogue community and the wider community of saints. We are grateful for this holy season of Advent, a season of waiting and anticipation. We ask that we maintain a Christ-centered life and that the Spirit will always be with us for a safe and healthy holiday. 
In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Um, before we lose everybody,